Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. So today we are celebrating Kentucky Derby weekend, which of course means big hats, as well as many celebratory drinks, including wine and bourbon. So we will be tasting and talking about those uh, delightful beverages today. We will be crafting a mint julep together and adding in a bit of horse racing education and speculation. So if you purchase the wines or bourbon ahead of time from wine.com, great, make sure they're open, um, get those ready to go. Um, if you don't, this duo, as you'll see, um, is commemorative and it is still available on wine.com, but only for a limited time. Um, these two wines that we're tasting are the commemorative bottles of Kendall Jackson Kentucky Derby Chardonnay and the Kendall Jackson Kentucky Derby Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and then of course, we're going to finish off with the Woodford Reserve Kentucky Bourbon. And we're gonna be crafting ourselves a mint julep in classic derby style. So we have with us today some lovely guests to help us through this to chat wine bourbon horses. Um, so from Jackson Family Estates, Kendall Jackson Wine Master, Randy Olam is here. Um, hi, Randy. Welcome. Um, we are also joined by Elizabeth McCall, Assistant Master Distiller from Woodford Reserve. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Hi. And then to cover all things horse racing, we have Todd Shrupp who is the main anchor at TVG, otherwise known as America's Horse Racing Network. So hi, Todd, welcome. Hey, happy Derby. Uh, happy Derby. Make that, make that toast right away. We do let people know you may start drinking at any time before we start discussing the wine. <laughs> it's it's true. Our, our classic style, we don't want to keep you. So, um, um, so you know, before we can start tasting um, the wine and the bourbon, Todd, I just kind of want to, bring you in just because we've had a couple of derby tastings already in the past couple of years um but what makes this weekend stand out to the world of horse racing why is the derby special uh because you only get one shot at it there's very few moments in sports that can live up to what the kentucky derby is it's just two minutes but it really represents a lifetime uh these horses these connections have been trying their whole lives to get to this moment but they only get one chance uh, to a person who doesn't follow the sport, they may not realize the Kentucky Derby is only for three-year-olds. So these horses only get to compete in their three-year-old season. They have to be good enough to compete. They have to pass through a series of races prior to the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. And then on that day, they go a distance they've never gone before, a mile and a quarter. And it is, as they say, the greatest two minutes in sports. And around that is what you're going to be talking about yeah are the fashion, you look fantastic by the way, and uh, the culture of it as well. It is something that has been around, obviously it's the 148th running coming up. To me, there is no equal in the sporting world. Yeah, it's, it is an exciting, it is an exciting time. I had the privilege of being able to attend last year, which we'll dive into later when I have more questions for you, <laughs> for derby and, and racing newbies like myself. But um, well, let's also, um, start with uh, some tasting um, the wines and the bourbon. We're going to start with the Kendall Jackson commemorative wines with Randy, uh, the wine master, maker, wine master and maker of, um, of Kendall Jackson wines. So, you know, this is the first time I've seen the, the commemorative bottles. What was kind of the idea behind Kendall Jackson creating commemorative bottles for the Kentucky Derby this year? Well, we're actually very blessed to be to be working with the Kentucky Derby and the and, and being chosen as sort of the wine of choice. And if you look at this at this label very closely, what's really unique is the jockey has the colors on of the of um, a yellow and sort of a, a maroon, a maroonish purple color. Those are the colors of the Stone Street stables or Stone Street Farm uh, that the Jacksons have uh, there in Kentucky. And then mm -hmm. he's sitting on a horse uh, called Good Magic that, that the Barbara and Stone Street Farms had running in the race a couple of years ago and uh, you know, came in second, which is still great, yep. uh, at least finish. And so that's, that was, that's the design that we did. We put on the, on the label for this special event, both on the, on the uh, Chardonnay and also on the Cabernet. So it's pretty, pretty neat to have that little reflection of, of history there. And of course, Stone Street Farms is the, 
you know, the home of Curlin and Rachel Alexandra and all these other great, great horses, you know, over the years and with a tremendous future. There's nothing but quality horses coming from that, those stables. Yeah, As I, yeah, I like from Kendall Jackson. I know, exactly. I think it's great that there is now that a kind of official partnership too with Kendall Jackson being the wine of choice at the Kentucky Derby. Um, and because of the passion behind this family in, in thoroughbred horse racing and they're, you know, being involved in the Kentucky Derby uh, on the horse side and now also on the wine side. So labels are beautiful. Yes. Um, let's and talk I a little bit about what's in the glass. So, yeah. um, so this is a so Chardonnay. Yep. It is a Chardonnay. And, and this is a Chardonnay from, from Mendocino County in right. the North coast of, of California. And so Mendocino County, and it's also barrel fermented, which is very important in French and American oak barrels, but it has this beautiful sort of golden hue to it. And that's from getting the grapes really nice and ripe. And then of course, fermenting the juice in barrels and aging it in barrels. But what's really wonderful about this is you have this, this wonderful aromatics uh, emanating from the glass. And so you have, you have the sort of the apple tones, the pear tones, there's a little bit of uh, citrus and it's sort of a kiss of, of uh, tropical notes. And then of course, when you, and that's just smelling it. So it looks good, it smells good. And then when you taste it, it's gonna be very mouth filling and, and rich and just maybe a little, a kiss of uh, some soft uh, sort of vanilla tones. And then, you know, besides it bringing a smile to your face after you, after you uh, smell it and, and taste it, and you're going to have this nice long lingering uh, finish that just kind of goes on and on and probably beckons you for another sip. Another sip. Yeah. I mean, I could just probably smell this all day also because I, I, I just, it's really a beautiful bouquet and it's just, I don't know, it's warm and welcoming and delicious just um, to do that, but <laughs> But it's a fantastic wine. But it's much better to say, yeah. Area, uh, in, in, in the greater scheme of Kendall Jackson, mm -hmm. or our Chardonnays, we source our grapes only from the cool coast of California. Right. And it goes from Mendocino up in the north to Sonoma County and Napa, uh, also in the area where, where, where I reside, and on down towards uh, Monterey and Santa Barbara. But this is very special uh, from, from Mendocino for this, this wonderful occasion. Yes. And, and I do love that. I mean, you're talking about the cool climate because I get that as that nose is so rich and ripe, but you, when you taste it, the acidity is like, you know, um, making sure it's stays very fresh and, and bright in the palate as well. Well, we're fortunate that you know, all these, all these vineyards and these counties and these areas that we work in are along this cool coast of California. And so we have that, that effect of the fog. I know many people probably, if they haven't visited here and felt, we're seeing the fog, have seen, I'm sure, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge with the fog coming in or going out. And that's our natural, uh, na our natural refrigeration system out here on the coast of California. But what it does, why it's so important, is it, it cools the air uh, in the evening and, and it comes in with this, you know, the fog, obviously, and it's still usually still there in the morning. So when the sun comes up, it can't really hit directly to and shine upon the leaves of these grapevines. So it takes a couple of hours in the morning for that fog to dissipate. And what that does is it creates a much longer growing season. And the longer it takes to get a grape ripe, the better it's gonna taste. Okay, so slow and steady. Exactly. Slow and steady. Um, well, let's move on to the, the Cabernet. This is coming from Napa Valley, um, right. as I understand. So just tell us a little bit about the, the grape selection and winemaking process for this one. Okay, so for our Cabernet, this is uh, from Napa. Uh, a good portion of it is from the uh, Calistoga area and the Oakville area, and then a little smattering of, of Howell Mountain and um, uh, Spring Mountain. It's a, but the majority of the, of the variety that's in this is Cabernet. We have a splash, like maybe eight or 9% uh, of Merlot thrown in and a kiss of Cab Franc, just to kind of add some complexity and dimension to this wine. Now for our, our Cabernets, what we like to do, when we, when we pick the grapes, of course, we're, we're, we're out in the vineyards, constantly tasting them, waiting for them to get, first they have to get sugar right, and then they have to get flavor right, and then they have to get what we call phenologically right, which is kind of a high-tech uh, fancy term for 
the skins and need to be to taste good and the seeds need to have gone from their green phase to their more dark brown brittle phase so that gives you a much softer uh, uh, mouthfeel in the wine and as you look at this you've got great color of course napa calves always give you a wonder, wonderful color and, and a great great texture but you have a little bit of blackberry um uh, black cherry little cocoa cocoa in in there and and then the you know, there is, it's it, these wines, after you make a red, to make a red wine, you have to ferment it with the skins, of course, and get, get all the colors. But when the fermentation is done, then you separate or press the, 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 the skins to get the juice separated from the skins, or now it's wine, actually, and put that wine in wonderful, lovely French oak barrels, uh, usually fine grain French oak with you know medium medium plus toast that kind of also accentuates the the cocoa cocoa tones uh, in the finish and sort of like a have a has a coffee tone and a cassis tone in the finish and then you're by aging it in those barrels for a period of time and also managing your ripeness levels when you're getting ready to pick the grapes you're softening the tannins and the tannins are that sort of drying sensation that you'll feel maybe on the side of your palate or on the tip of your tongue. Uh, kind of like a, if you've ever had a, you know, a very hardcore old world or old fashioned, like a Chianti, let's say, you know, they can be a little on the dry side. Well, we're trying to soften that in, in the palate. And then again, you make it a very approachable and inviting to have your, your next sip also. Um, yes, absolutely. I love that. And you talked about the coffee. I got the coffee when you mentioned that, but yeah, very complex nose, delicious palate, soft tannins. Um, exactly. Classic Napa. Easy to drink. Napa. and wow. Easy to drink. Mm. So we got Elizabeth, are you enjoying the wines? Oh, I am loving them. And also I, I love Randy that you know, I taste bourbon whiskey all the time, but to sit down and I'm like nosing and what you're saying for attributes I'm getting as well. So it, it makes me feel good about my tasting abilities, but I, I absolutely love Kendall Jackson wines. We're drinking the Chardonnay last night um, with my family. And then I love the cab. I'm a huge cab fan. So this is delicious. Great. Oh, thank you. And I bet you're obviously quite familiar with all the oak and oak aging that goes into these wines. And, you know, we blend, uh, depending on the wine, you know, French oak and American oak. And, and um, I think you're predominantly probably American oak, but it's just, how you toast them and how long you age a wine or a bourbon in the barrel really, you know, it, it enhances it for starters and, and creates more of a softness in the, in the palate, regardless of what the liquid is or the libation may be. Exactly. And we actually utilize the toasting process in making our Woodford Reserve barrels. So there's that tie between the wine, um, how you all make your wines and your barrels and what we do with our barrels as well. And there's definitely a softness with the toasting. So Todd, this probably isn't your, I mean, they go through tasting day after day after day, which is not <laughs> in your day-to-day -day description. So well, I'm, are you enjoying I'm the wines, learning yeah, a lot? I'm, I'm, not tasting, I'm, I'm, I'm not tasting day-to-day, -day, I'm drinking day-to-day. -day. Okay, <laughs> so, I'll rephrase, that. yes. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, the dilemma I think around derby time are these commemorative bottles because I want to drink what's inside. So, uh, for example, what Randy's put out with the label that he described, um, I want to hold on to that bottle, but I can't. So I got over to drink it. But there's a lot of people who will buy two because they want to keep the bottle with the label. And it's the same thing with what Woodford Reserve does. One of the most popular bottles in all of the bourbon industry is the Kentucky Derby one that Elizabeth and her crew put out. So I made sure that I got two of them yeah. back here because I'm going to open one very soon uh, on my trip. But it's such a beautiful bottle. And this is for the 148th running of the Kentucky Derby this year. But I've got them going back 20 years uh, wow. back home for me. Um, just yeah. such great credit to Woodford Reserve and the special uh, commemorative bottle that yeah. they do each year. It's sought after uh, around the Commonwealth and around the world. Yeah. And now we'll be keeping some Kendall Jackson ones too. Although you can also drink what's in the bottle and then just save the empty bottle <laughs> for the label. <laughs> so just, yeah, you know, I also to get several bottles though, just yeah, to start. Exactly. And we have, we yeah. have several. So, <laughs> Randy's got the right idea. Um, so, so Elizabeth, let's move on to that, that Woodford Reserve, because I'm, I'm going to, I want to touch on the artistry as well, but I mean, Woodford Reserve in general just is, is such a 
steeped in history in Kentucky and bourbon culture. So maybe you could touch just a little bit on um, kind of, it's a national landmark, right? Some of that history. Yes. yes. So Woodford Reserve, we opened our doors at our distillery in 1996, but the actual site itself has such a wonderful history. Uh, distilling started there in 1812 and continued on, obviously paused during prohibition. Um, but these buildings are from the 1800s and we are a modern distillery nestled amongst all this historical, um, the historical site, but then also historical practices. And so, Distilling started in 1812, but we opened our doors uh, with Woodford Reserve in 1996. The National Historic Landmark is registered under Lebro and Graham, and that's because that's you know, we first started distilling as Lebro and Graham Distillery, home of innovative and um, boutique whiskeys. And then Woodford Reserve was just this shining star that stood out, and eventually we had to change the name to the Woodford Reserve Distillery. Okay, um, and and Todd obviously mentioned this commemorative bottle, uh, which changes every year. Um, how many years has it been? How you had? So we became the official bourbon of the Kentucky Derby in 1996. We are the only bourbon to be the official bourbon of Churchill Downs of the Kentucky Derby. And that started in 1999. I'm sorry, it's 1999 is when we started. And that's when we started the commemorative bottles as well. Um, and this year's I'm, I'm so excited about because the artist for this year's bottle, Jamie Corum, she is a Kentucky native, but also an equestrian. She has ridden horses her entire life, grew up drawing horses and has obviously perfected it. And what I love that she captured in this portrait is the fact that the horses, you look at each of them and you can see that they each have a different motive. One's kind of out there, he's very confident. The other one's like, I'm catching up, I'm gonna get you guys. And the other one is kind of looking back a little bit. And she did such a great job of capturing that moment. And, you know, Todd, I just love how you describe, I mean, when you were talking about the Derby, it gave me goosebumps. I'm an equestrian and those two minutes, I mean, it's just, there's no way to describe it other than being there and, and watching on television and just kind of get like, it, it's one shot, one shot. And it's amazing. So um, she did a great job of capturing that intensity in this portrait. Yeah, I don't have a collection <laughs> at home yet. Maybe I'll start from from last year. But um, especially the ro the floral, the roses. I just this is such a stunning um, a piece because the art. I don't know if we explained it, but the art does change every year. This commemorative bottle, and it's a new artist with a new um, drawing label um, artistry each year. And this one, I think, it's called Dreams in Bloom. Is that right? Yes, yes. And it's the first time I've really seen so many flowers all around. It's spring in Kentucky. It's just, it's it, beautiful. It is. And then, yeah, and the horses do, they seem to have personalities, which is just very, very cool. So that's stunning. Let's taste this, this bourbon. So um, if you have my little bourbon glass. You got um, your bourbon glass. Yes. So we've got <laughs> the Woodford Reserve bourbon here and it is, there are 215 flavor attributes in one glass, one sip of Woodford Reserve. And the way that we do that is by just using our water source. We have limestone water. We have our grain recipe, which is 72% corn, 18% rye, 10% malted barley, our own proprietary yeast strain for fermentation. At Woodford, we're triple pot distilling. And then of course, as I mentioned with Randy, we have our barrels that are American white oak barrels. They're toasted and then charred. So we're toasting as a separate part of the process and charring. And then we age for minimum five years, but could go all the way up to 10, 12 years. You know, it's just, it's a lot. But what I love about the flavor profile of our whiskey is that it's vanillas and sweet on the nose, but sometimes you get spice. Sometimes the fruit comes out, the floral, all the different things. Um, and, and it's really just, I think it's like a diamond. And when the, whatever mood is hitting you, you might get the spice first, you might get the fruit first. It just kind of goes back and forth. And then on the palate, you know, it's a little spicy. There's some sweet aromatics. Obviously, I always get caramel. Um, you get the oak character coming through really nice. And the finish is really long on Woodford. It has all those malt mm -hmm. notes come out and it's a little candied pecan at times. So some of that just kind of comes through really nicely. And um, what makes it so great is that it goes great in pretty much any cocktail on its own or on the rocks. And we have a mint julep that we're going to do, Yay. obviously, because we're talking okay. about the Kentucky Derby. Right. And mint juleps are like the classic drink. 
It is the classic drink. Yeah, no, I, I love this thing. I mean, Woodford Reserve is, is so great. I've kind of, over the past decade or so, kind of come back to bourbon because I drank way too much in college in Virginia. Um, and it wasn't the good kind. So it's so oh. nice to have just these, I mean, just really high quality um, bourbon. I, I, I do um, love it. Yes, um, it so, does but, make it, it makes a difference to have that good quality yeah. bourbon. Because yeah. um, I've heard it's many similar to wine. I mean, it's similar to, you know, wine, it's similar to a lot of things in life, but um, yes. yeah, definitely when it comes to hard alcohol, I think that that, that quality is um, in spirits. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful bourbon. Um, okay. So mint julep. Yes. You're going to make us one. It's the classic. Um, so what, give us the secrets. Make it okay. Fun. So I have the mint julep is really simple and I do have, so we have a partnership with, um, uh, uh, William Sonoma and they do a mint simple syrup, but you can make your own simple syrup. There's really, you know, you can do a mint simple syrup. You can do a regular simple syrup. It really doesn't matter, but it's super easy to make this drink, but you can also, um, dial different portions of it up to make it fit your palate. But first things first is I do have opal ice or just crushed ice is key. Um, and so make sure you have that going on. And I also have a lot of fresh mint you can see right here, but what we do for the mint julep is take some mint the way I like to do mine, I guess there's many different ways, but this is how I like to I take my mint julep cup and I'm rubbing the mint on the inside of the cup. And that just kind of gives you a hint of the mint character going on in the cup. You can always smell it. It's just really fresh and, um, and easy to sip on. Then I'm going to take my Woodford reserve and I'm going to do two ounces. So one, 1,000 to 1,000. We always say two ounces of the best bourbon for the best two minutes in sports. Then I'm going to take my simple syrup and I'm going to have a half ounce of that right into the mint julep cup. And finally, I'm going to take my ice, so crushed ice, and I'm gonna add that in there. And so I have a way of doing this that is kind of, I'm particular about it. So I fill up with my ice. You can already see that there's a nice little frost going on on the cup. Then I take my spoon and I'm going to spin it around in the cup and it's just gonna to continue to frost that, mix up the ingredients, so you don't have all your syrup on the bottom and all the whiskey on top, because what happens is with your straw, then all you get is sugary mintiness. It's not so pleasant. Then I'm going to take my straw and I have a sprig of mint and tuck that in, but then you top it off with more ice and you want it to almost look like a nice little snow cone effect, because what's fun is that your mint julep is a morning drink. So if you would have been, it's one of my favorite stories about the mint julep. So you have the, if you woke up, you know, in the 1800s, early 1900s, you're working on the horse farm. You didn't have aspirin. You had whiskey to soothe your aching joints and muscles. Then you have the sweetness of the simple syrup to soften the alcohol. And of course the mint to freshen your breath. So this is the mint julep. I'm going to give it a quick taste. I, I remind you, but. Delicious any time of day, but it's such a tradition at the Derby. So I hope everyone enjoys one either watching at home or at the race. Or throwing a Derby party. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I do sometimes take the straw out because otherwise I find that it's empty really quickly. <laughs> this <laughs> is true. <laughs> um, yeah. And tell us a little bit also, there is, um, you had mentioned something when we spoke earlier about the 1000, is it the $1,000 julep program? Oh, yes. So we do a $1,000 mint julep program. And this program kind of changes um, who the, the cocktail changes, the cup changes, but everybody's like, what is a thousand dollars? How could it be like a thousand dollar bill just in the <laughs> cup? If you yeah. yeah. Well, it's for a charitable cause. That's why we do it this year. We're supporting old friends, which is a retirement community, essentially for thoroughbreds. And we have ex derby winners there um, living out their, their best life, you know, their, their greatest years um, just in these beautiful pastures. So we're supporting them. It's a commemorative cup every year. It changes. Um, and then also we have, uh, so we've got the, and then the, the recipe changes. So this year we're kind of celebrating the connection between Versailles, France and Versailles, Kentucky, where our distillery is. Um, and so we've got sort of French theme with citrus of orange lemon and some pomegranate in there and a honey simple syrup from France. So it, it's a beautiful mint julep, different take on the mint julep and um, for a good cause. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, that's going to that um, charity too. It's a great, 
great partnership. Yes. Um, excellent. Well, um, Todd, do you like a good julep also when you're hanging at the Derby? I, or I do. And, and here's sure. the other thing. I drink more old fashions uh, than maybe probably anyone on this panel. And <laughs> the Double Oak Woodford, if you have not had Double Oak Woodford, it's my go-to bourbon constantly. I've got to always be around a bottle of Double Oak. And then I'm also kind of a little bit of a kid. I love the Luxardo cherries, the dark, oh, yeah. uh, deep purple cherries. Oh. I got to have extra ones muddled and on the spear too. But Double Oak Woodford is phenomenal to me. Fantastic. Good to know. Let's try that next. So um, so let's talk a little bit about horse racing. But but first, uh, you know, it, as it pertains to the Kentucky Derby, but, you know, you've been part of America's um, Horse Racing Network, TGV, for, since it's launched in 1999. Um, no, oh, oddly, also the launch of the commemorative bottle. How convenient. Um, <laughs> yes, but I know you've been following the sport for much longer than that, too. But what drew you, got you into horse racing? A lot of people have a similar story, and that is my dad took me out to the racetrack. And that's my story. My dad mm -hmm. took me out to the racetrack. Um, he was stationed at Camp Pendleton. He was a Marine. And uh, we were in Southern California. And I remember taking the bus out to the racetrack with him and I would just be on the playground, but I'd watch these horses come by and it took, it took my interest. I was just seven at the time. And it's so weird. Think about what you remember from when you were seven, you can hardly remember anything, but I remember being on the playground at Del Mar. And I remember watching a guy cheering a race and he kept yelling, come on pirate, come on pirate. It was years later that I would learn he, that was the nickname for one of the greatest jockeys of all time, Lafitte Pink Eye Jr. And I bring it up because it came full circle for me. The first year that TVG launched, as you said, in 1999, the biggest event we covered was Lafitte Pinkai Jr. becoming the all-time winningest jockey ever. So to go from seven years old to, I'll give my age away, 30 at the time, and uh, be covering Lafitte Pinkai to go from that playground to now being on a, a network that covered horse racing full-time meant a lot to me. And, and the one thing about horse racing Yes, it's where I make my living, but I'm a huge fan as well. So to be around it on a daily basis and to meet the heroes that I had growing up and then watching um, other athletes within the sport become legends, uh, it truly is a remarkable job for me. But my, my main thing that I always want to get across is not how grateful necessarily I am for the sport, but I want that passion to be translated to someone watching at home. So they want to go to the Kentucky Derby. So they want to come to Keeneland race course here at Kentucky, or they want to go to Santa Anita. Um, I'm hoping that through my passion, other people become fans of the sport. And, and uh, that's my main goal at TVG is if you can't be there, you got the next best thing watching us and uh, feeling the passion that I bring to it. And my colleagues bring to it as well. Great. And you, you say passion. I think that, you know, everyone here that we're, that we're all talking today also are, are like that with wine or spirits and wanting to share that passion, being so excited. I'm loving it so much that then you go and find a career where you can share it with others. And, so and, and, and Gwendolyn, one, one thing about horse racing that differentiates it from other sports, aside from it's different in its own right, is think about it. When you go to a football game, when you go to a baseball game, you're cheering on the team. You're not actually participating. You're watching the game and you're cheering on the team. But in horse racing, because you can bet on those horses, when you put a bet on a horse, that horse is yours. That horse is yours for that two minutes. So when you bet on the Kentucky Derby this year, let's say you're gonna bet on one of the favorites like Epicenter or Zandon, that horse is yours for those two minutes. You are a participant. That's another thing that separates horse racing from other sports. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, okay, so I had the opportunity to go to the Derby last year. Um, and it was lovely, but I'm a total newbie to horse racing, even though my husband, um, knows what he's doing. He's not, it's always as great as explaining it to me. So, and, 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 um, and I bet you won more money than him too. He knows what he's doing. Okay. You knew. I always, yeah. I'm a, I'm a shy better though. And so when I do bet, even if I do well, it's like, I only put in a little bit. I'm not, I'm not quite, quite a, a better yet, but maybe I'll get there. Um, but you talked a little bit about this on, on all these races that kind of get to the Derby. What? How does how do we determine which horses run in the Derby? Because you did mention they have to be three years old. And that's it. So yeah. That's one so, qualification. And then well, how else do they get there? Only three-year-olds participate in the Kentucky Derby. So you only get that one chance. They go a mile and a quarter. 
but only 20 horses can go into the starting gate for the Kentucky Derby. So they basically determine that on a point system. So these horses have been running since the beginning of the year in January in races that are considered prep races for the Kentucky Derby. So one race might be worth 50 points to the winner. So they get 50 points if they win, 20 points to second, and they accumulate those points as they go throughout the year and we get to the first Saturday May. There are some races, the earliest age a horse will start racing, a thoroughbred race horse is at the age of two. So many of these horses started racing at the age of two. There's a couple of races that they can earn points in towards the Kentucky Derby at two. But most of the big races to earn points are as three-year-olds. So what you're going to get on the first Saturday in May are the top 20 point earners who have raced in all the big races around the country and run well. And so this really represents the best of the best. Now, there are some horses that have some bad luck and, and can't make the first Saturday in May. And that's what we go, go back to. It's like you only get this one shot at this one moment in time. And you have to be a little bit lucky as well. It's 20 horses. There's going to be a lot of stories coming out of the first Saturday in May of a horse who could have won, but had a bad trip, ran into some trouble during the race, couldn't overcome it. And then that's what's great about the Triple Crown. They start with the Kentucky Derby. There's three races that make up the Triple Crown and Thoroughbred Racing. The Kentucky Derby on the first Saturday in May. Two weeks later, they go to Baltimore and Pimlico for the Preakness. And then three weeks later, they go to the Belmont to go a mile and a half. So these three-year-olds, to sweep the Triple Crown, you've got to win three races in five weeks. They don't normally run that many races in that amount of time, all at different distances, from the mile and a quarter of the Kentucky Derby, the mile and three-sixteenths of the Preakness, and then the test of the champion, the longest distance that they will travel, a mile and a half. So when you look at horses like American Pharaoh and Justify, the two most recent horses to sweep the Triple Crown, they are very, very special animals because it takes – a remarkable thoroughbred to sweep the triple crown, but you got to start with the Kentucky Derby. Got to start with the Kentucky Derby. Okay. And then just also uh, for, for being there, I was, I was also one thing that I had as a question being there is there are a lot of races happening, but there's only <laughs> those that, that one, one at the end, the two minute Derby. I'm like, well, what are all these other ones going on? So kind of what, what else happens, happens there this weekend? Yeah. When you walk into Churchill Downs or if you're watching what's going on at Churchill Downs on the first Saturday in May, we're not just there for the Kentucky Derby, as you pointed out. Uh, typically, they'll have a 14 race card. Uh, they will have a number of races leading up to the Kentucky Derby. And then because of traffic flow, they'll have a couple of races after the Kentucky Derby. And as your husband can tell you and someone like myself who plays the races on a daily basis, I'm just as excited about the other races as well from a betting point of view. Think about this for a moment, Gwendolyn. The last Kentucky Derby we had, just the Kentucky Derby, the amount of money wagered on that race alone in 2021 was $155 million. But the entire day, the entire card, they bet last year $233 million. So this represents a great opportunity. It's a lucrative opportunity to play the races. And you don't have to be someone who follows it year round. You don't have to be someone who even understands all of the betting. You just kind of need to find your niche. Maybe you just want to bet a horse to win, but you're going to be able to bet a lot of races prior to the Kentucky Derby. And obviously if you have a TVG account, you're going to be able to sign up and exactly. there's other races going on around the country that day as well. I mean, that's the one thing about horse racing. It's 365 days out of the year. But the Kentucky Derby manages to stand out because of the huge pools and obviously the stories that you're going to hear about these remarkable thoroughbreds. Of course. And, and the fashion leads into it, too. <laughs> um, but for someone who's who's you know watching the Derby at home or this year, either, either the, the big race or even some of the races leading up to it, um, are there tips that you have just to get the most out of it, how they make an educated pick? Maybe like so Here's what I will always tell everyone. What's amazing about the sport is how it's a great equalizer. So I've been following these horses. In fact, I'm on a trip that has taken me from one of the big prep races, the Louisiana Derby in New Orleans. I flew directly to Miami for the Florida Derby. Then I've come to Kentucky to be here for a five week run up to the Kentucky Derby. So I know these horses inside and out. I study for hours. I know the connections and I'll arrive at a horse and then someone will show up at the Kentucky Derby for the first time, like the name, and we like the same horse. And my point to you is, no matter what your system is, eventually it's going to work. Maybe you <laughs> like the color yellow, you like the Stone Street silks, and that's right. what you want to play when you go to the track. That's fine. Maybe you like the number nine, it's your lucky number. 
the, the key is not always the handicapping because eventually every system works. Every system picks a winner. The key is how you bet. And in horse racing, there are two kinds of bets. We describe them this way, a vertical wager, meaning going from the top down to the bottom or a horizontal wager, which means race to race. So for example, you talked about there's more than the Kentucky Derby on the first Saturday, in May. Well, a horizontal wager connects races to races. So if you play a daily double, you're trying to pick two winners in a row in different races. If you're playing a pick three, you're trying to pick three winners in a row. So you're going this way horizontally, a pick four, four winners in a row, pick five, five winners in a row. When I say vertically, you're talking about one race. So for example, many people have probably heard of an exacta or a trifecta. What an exacta means is it's vertical. You're picking the winner, then the second place finisher. When you're playing a trifecta, you're picking the top three finishers, first, second, third. Then there's a superfecta, first, second, third, fourth. Then there's a super high five, first, second, third, fourth. Fifth. Don't get overwhelmed by everything. Don't try and take on everything in one day in horse racing. Pick one wager, stay with it. If you're having some luck with it, then maybe move on to another wager. And when I say that the Kentucky Derby presents a great betting opportunity, think about this for a moment. Last year in the Kentucky Derby, if you had the top two finishers, if you had the exacta, it paid for $2, $503. If you had the trifecta, which you can play for as little as 50 cents or a 50 cent increment, it came back $848. If you had the superfecta, the top four finishers in order, the dollar superfecta was $9,400. If you had the top five finishers in the Kentucky Derby, the super high five, one, two, three, four, five. $296,000. So you see how the degree of difficulty goes up from yeah. exacta, but the payoffs go up with it as well. Right. Oh. Now that's a good tip, even if it's just putting in $2. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to um, figure out some of our own uh, horse picks. Um, and Todd, you have to go last. So as not to. <laughs> us. Um, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Um, do you have, one or two top picks who stands out to you this year um, coming up? You know, I, it's funny because I usually like to go for like, what's a bourbon name? I'm like one of those that goes in for the name. <laughs> so, but, but this year I'm going to try to be a little smarter with my bets. And so Epicenter is at the top. So uh, as of right now, everything can change leading right up to the race, as we all know, um, but at the center and then um, was it summer comes tomorrow or so, co summer come tomorrow, something like that, just because I want summer to come. <laughs> so I like the name. That's the name. That's the name. Uh, that's a good one. Randy, what are your uh, tips? Well, you know, I, uh, I got my hundred bucks right here. <laughs> And I, you know, I love the names. I have my favorite number two, seven. That's always nice. The names are great. But I, I think this year I'm going to do, do the numbers thing and, and go, go for, you know, someone who's like in the 40 to one range kind of plus or minus 10 there. And, and, and if it's a, you know, a high wild, wild bet with a nice name and a good number, that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh that's perfect. That's strategy right there. Um, of course, and, after and, starting my day with a mint and julep, I, I thought you started your day with Chardonnay, but now it's the whole thing. <laughs> and, no, I think everything has its own time and place. It's, it's yeah. Mint julep, then Chardonnay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Same enough. that. We can mix and match. Um, so Todd, I know, um, you know, you probably, it must, it's probably hard to make a bet until like that exact day you know, an hour before the race starts. Um, so, but leaning towards? Well, Elizabeth is right. Um, we, you know, things can change right up until race time and I reserve the right to change my mind. But Elizabeth uh, is also very intuitive about who the horse is to beat. Epicenter has had a brilliant, brilliant spring. Uh, he's had most of his prep races uh, down in Louisiana. His trainer, Steve Asmussen, is the all-time winningest trainer in the sport, but he's never won the Kentucky Derby. So that's going to be one of the storylines. Can Steve Asmussen finally break through and win the Kentucky Derby? As much respect as I have for Epicenter, I've got even more respect for Zandon, who won the Toyota Bluegrass Stakes here at Keeneland. He made a move from off the pace that is usually the Derby-type winning move. And this is a story I've not told on air, which I can only tell, tell here. Um, and that is so... I'm here in Lexington, Kentucky. I went to a local restaurant 
uh, Chad Brown, the trainer of Zandon, was there. And he has a deal with the local restaurant tour where after graded stakes races, he'll put uh, that restaurant's blanket on his horse that has won. So he, uh, I was standing with the owner of the restaurant and Chad Brown looked at the owner and said, how's it going to feel to put uh, your blanket on the winner of the Kentucky Derby this year? So Chad Brown is brimming with confidence. He trains Zandon, who won the Toto Bluegrass Stakes, and he trains Early Voting, who was second in New York in the Wood Memorial. Um, so mark me down as Zandon, and I'm following that confidence of the trainer, Chad Brown. Uh, but no matter who you wager on, I promise you, with all the tips that you've uh, given here on how to enjoy the Kentucky Derby, it is going to be a wonderful Saturday. Yeah, beautiful Saturday, fun race. Um, I was going to go with Epicenter, but now I, I'm feeling, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll wait till day of also just sitting there <laughs> right before the race. Um, well, thank you all so much um, for being here as a reminder for everybody at home. Um, this, this duo of wines, um, limited edition commemorative for the Kentucky Derby can still be found on wine.com for a limited time. And in the select states where we're able to ship spirits, we also have the um, Woodford Reserve um, commemorative bottling as well. So check that out. Um, I hope um, you know everybody has a great Derby weekend for, for uh, the panel here, Todd, Elizabeth, and Randy. Thank you so much for giving your time, your energy, your horse picks, um, just all around delicious and educational. So I'm um, excited to have all these wonderful things to drink while we watch the race. Uh, yeah, yeah. Derby weekend to everyone. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice, and now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.